All right, so I did my indie lab on a comparison between a home theater speaker and a home theater subwoofer. And uh, home theater is basically just like a consumer set of speakers that you might buy for like $300 from Best Buy or something. Um, better than like desktop, desktop speakers, but not as good as like a movie theater. So um, why am I doing this? What is my purpose? Um, I wanted to find the frequency range, which I'll get to that later, um, for each of the two different speakers. Uh, what, at what frequencies do these speakers produce their maximum sound pressure, which we're also going to get to later. Um, I wanted to discover the specific role of each speaker and how they work together to make a full sound. Um, it might be kind of obvious, uh, you know, you've got the big subwoofer for the small speakers, um, but I wanted to kind of delve more into that and take some data and see why it's happening. Um, so here's a few like just definitions. Um, subwoofer, it's it's the uh, biggest speaker. It's usually much larger than the other ones. It has a large cone, um, often around, uh, you know, and these these are in inches because that's how these manufacturers do it. Uh, eight, ten. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Right. That's how these manufacturers. No, do I know it. I'm sorry. Um, center speakers, it's one of the, so the, the system I use had five main speakers separate from the subwoofer, it's a 5.1 system. I use the centermost speaker, which is just the one that goes in the center. Um, small, it had, the one I used had a three inch cone. Um, sound pressure is the local pressure deviation from the ambient um, atmospheric pressure caused by a sound wave. So sound pressure is basically how you hear sound. It's changes in the pressure around you. It's how your ear picks up um, the sound. Uh, optimal frequency range is something I kind of define for my purposes. Um, it's kind of going to be the range at which a speaker, a speaker produces most of its sound pressure and most, um, meaning more than uh, like I think 20 or 30 percent is what I used. Uh, there's not an exact definition for this online, but I this is a very uh, qualitative lab, so I kind of made that definition for myself to show my observations. So here's my setup. Um, we've got the subwoofer here, it's um, Sony brand. We've got a LabQuest, the receiver, at, it's uh, 800 watts total. Uh, each speaker uses up to 130. Uh, the center speaker, microphone, I use a 3.5 millimeter uh, input, and then the computer was playing all of the test tones. So for, I made some hypotheses. Um, for part one, I was going to. So, what I did for part one is I did a frequency sweep. Um, these can be found online. It goes from generally uh, 20 hertz all the way up to 20,000 hertz. And it's just a clean sweep that um, exponentially increases. So like if it's a four minute video, it'll go slowly from 20 to 100. And then it'll, it'll keep picking up speed until it reaches all the way up to 20,000. That's what a frequency sweep is. So for part one, that's what I used. I thought the subwoofer would pick up really low, peak really low, and then fall, and then just kind of have almost no sound pressure whatsoever, getting up in those higher frequencies, higher than like you know, 200, 300 hertz. And I hypothesized that the center speaker would um, pick up much later, peak for a while longer, and then drop finally around, I think, yeah, I think I said like 20,000 hertz, it won't quite hit that, because that's, that's um, about as high as the human ear can here. Uh, for part two, what I did was I did um, set test tones. So I would do 50, 100, 150, 200, 250, and 300 hertz. Just playing that tone, letting it ring out, taking data, and um, compiling those into a graph and comparing the subwoofer versus the center speaker. Uh, so I hypothesized that the subwoofer would exhibit a frequency range uh, expressing most of its sound pressure between 50 and 150 hertz, and the center speaker would exhibit a range of about 120 to 10,000 hertz. So, um, and by the way, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, I, did, I used the Logger Pro microphone, and these units are in sound pressure arbitrary. Um, so these can't really be converted into anything because they're arbitrary. That's the unfortunate caveat of free near technology when it comes to that specific microphone, um, which was what I had available, so I had to make it work. Um, and that's why this lab is very qualitative, because I can't really do much with these numbers, except for compare them to other numbers. Uh, so here's the graph of part one of the subwoofer. This is the frequency sweep. Down here is the time. So around 10 seconds, 
it started picking up, and 10 seconds was, um, I, it was like 60 hertz. Uh, it, I'll show you that later. It was pretty low, and then it would pick up, peaked for a little while, and then dropped around 50 seconds. The center speaker was a much different story. It started picking up around, I don't know, that looks like about 30, and it peaked, dropped a little bit, peaked again, dropped, peaked, dropped, peaked, dropped, and then cut out completely at 18,000 hertz. Um, it, it cut out at 18,000 hertz because YouTube cannot play any sounds higher than 18,000 hertz. I discovered that through some research. So, uh, this is the graphic part two. This is one where I did the constant test tone sounds for each speaker. And I uh, compared the values and kind of just what I expected. The subwoofer um, started really low, around, looks like, uh, 20, 30 hertz, picked up, uh, peaked right at 100 hertz, and then slowly dropped all the way down to almost nothing at 300 hertz, kind of what I expected. The center speaker, though, um, picked up, kept picking up, it, 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 you could hear sound from it through, from 20 hertz, but the sound pressure was very low, as you can see. Uh, it picked up, and it appears to be dropping, but from the previous graph, we see that that's not true at all. It goes for a long time. And keep in mind, this is a 20,000 hertz frequency sweep all the way up to 18,000. So this speaker was producing sound all the way up to the cutoff of YouTube. So this is a little misleading because it doesn't actually drop. It actually keeps going for a long time. Um, I think one way to rectify that in the future would be to take much more data points with much more test tones, um, having more time and resources. Okay, so what I find, sound pressure started to rapidly increase at 30 hertz. Um, I kind of already explained this, stayed at a constant peak, and then dropped. And the way I found these exact frequencies was I actually went back to the video, and I stopped it at specific times to find what that, um, what that frequency was. It, it wasn't very difficult at all. Um, so that's where I'm getting these 30 hertz, 68 um, through 141. 0 to 283 and such, using the time from that video and what the screen displayed as the hertz being played. So I kind of already explained that one. Same with this one. It, it, um, the peaks were 230, 6400, 10,000, 17,000. Um, those are you know, here, 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 here. Um, and it kind of went down and went back up from here. And uh, this so this is what I concluded from this graph would be this speaker's optimal frequency range because this is a huge peak. It went down a little bit and then came up and huge peaked again and then kind of just fell down. So looking at that, not knowing a lot about sound at this time, I was like, well, if I just looked at this, you know, I think that could be the optimal frequency range right there and it seems pretty reasonable. It was uh, 230 to 6400 hertz. Okay, so anything else? Yes, uh, using this graph, I had another perspective without the um, sweep. So this shows the relationship between the two speakers, kind of explained that already. Um, and you can see the subwoofer is, again, it's producing its maximum frequency at 100. And I, I think I, uh, I mentioned, forgot to mention something here. Off of this graph, I concluded that the frequency range was 60 to 140 hertz for the subwoofer. And then again, 230 to 6400 hertz. And this graph kind of co confirms that. Uh, 60 to 140, yes, it's pretty high at 60. It's also pretty high at 140, right about like that. And that expresses a lot of the speaker's um, sound pressure. Uh, and again, this, the center speaker is kind of, kind of misleading here because there's not enough data points to truly represent uh, how high it's going to go. So basically, I found the relationship between the two speakers. A subwoofer performs best in the low frequencies, putting out a very um, high sound pressure at those low frequencies using the larger cone. It's pushing more air at the, at the lower frequencies. Uh, the center speaker performs best in the mid to high range, as expected, using a small cone to represent the high frequencies at a higher sound pressure than the subwoofer can. Uh, and the ultimate conclusion basically is together they cover a large range of frequencies, giving them the ability to play music and express uh, a large um, spectrum of the frequency range. You can hear the bass and you can hear the high frequencies. That's what they do.
I have no questions for anybody but me. Me, me, me. I have three questions. Go ahead. One, did you in your research learn anything about Nyquist frequency? I did not. Okay, I'll tell you about that in just a second. Second question, why do you think YouTube is not playing any sound above 18,000 hertz? Hmm. Well, on initial thought, I would assume it's just because humans can't really hear at that level. Um, I don't really know if there would be any software or hardware limitations with the, pro the program YouTube. I don't know if they can't like code for frequencies higher than that. Um, but yeah, I think I would assume just because humans can't hear higher than that anyway, so why would it have, what's the purpose of having that function? having that extra RAM being taken up for that data that says to play it higher. There's a cost associated with that bandwidth, right? No, no point in having it. Right. Uh, so YouTube is not as wonderful for dogs. You would have to actually redesign the right. streaming algorithms for dogs. Okay, so back to Nyquist sampling frequency. There's an issue with Logger Pro where it defaults to setting at, I think, 10,000 samples per second on the microphone. Which would mean that it can only reasonably sample up to 5,000 hertz, which could be why you had a tapering after 6,000 or so. Right. Just because it's not sampling often enough. Now you can change that frequency of sampling so that you can get better data. So we might have found even better performance at the high end of your um, of your tweeter there. Can you take us back to the tweeter graph for my third question? The waveform. The, the yeah. Waveform. Oh yeah, the one where you were doing the tweet because I thought that was amazing. Do you have any uh, possible explanation for the the significant dip? I, I think it's not a coincidence. I think there's a significant dip in the middle. Yeah, what's going on? Significant dip in the middle. I think that's real. I think it's actually making less sound in the middle of our range of hearing than it is at the two ends. Um, might have something to do with the magnet. Uh, we, it peaks at 230 and then peaks again. This was the 6400 hertz. I think it's designed to do it. I don't think it's a limitation. I think no, it's purposeful. It. Um, I'm not sure. It's conjecture. Perhaps the other speakers are, since they're slightly smaller, um, their construction allows them to have better sound pressure output at this. But why would a designer range? want that? Um, less power. Okay. Not trying to drive, not trying to have every speaker um, use. So if the smaller speakers can represent a superior sound pressure at that range, why would you have the middle speaker, which is a little bit larger, driving at a higher, um, like using more power to do the same thing when it's not doing it as well? So I think there are two neat things going on here. One, uh, sound energy is really cheap. So driving a speaker is actually really cheap for everybody all the time. Um, so it, I don't think it's driven by an efficiency issue, but there's something going on inside your head. When you perceive sound, you're incredibly good at perceiving sounds right where that trough is. Right where that trough is. And I would bet that human hearing peaks right as that troughs, canceling out that effect. Oh, I see. So they... So it still uses less power, but you hear that better. Right. But if they had it flat, then you'd think that the ones that you hear best are actually louder. I see. So they're trying to correct for your sensitivity to hearing in that range, that peak range where we've evolved to hear very, very well. Those sounds, I guess, that signal threats or uh, food sources or something, you know, bananas swaying in the wind. And alternatively, is that why a subwoofer has to be so large to push those sound pressures? because we're not really good at hearing them down there. Frankly, we suck at hearing those frequencies. All right. And and that's why you're going to feel bass if you're hearing it well. Yes, because and that's where you would have a lot of energy. That's why you need an amplifier in your car if you want to hear a lot of bass. You put a subwoofer in there and that's going to cost you some money. I see. Cool. Thank you. Right. We don't have time for that question. You can ask me after class.